Hello, I'm Chris Temple from Pyro Studios, and you're watching Indie Rebel, Hollywood effects without the Hollywood budget. Today, we are going to go over a complete ingest to completion post-production workflow uh, for a short or feature film, and doing it all yourself on just a single computer. Uh, workflow is something that's very important to me. I've got this entire binder filled with uh, just different notes and things like that. And recently, I've gotten into the ACES workflow, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. This entire workflow is designed around ACES color science and color management. And I'm going to show you guys what I've learned and how we can uh, shoot with a variety of different cameras, convert them into the ACES workspace, do your offline editing in something like Avid Media Composer, bring it all back into DaVinci Resolve, conform to the onlines, then do your visual effects over in Nuke, uh, do your sound mix in like the Fairlight page of Resolve, and then finally how to strike your masters and any dubs that you would need from there afterwards. So this is going to be probably a very long video. I don't know how long it's going to be, but there's a lot of really useful information and things that I've learned as I've been doing this over the course of my latest short film, Fins. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, well, here we are inside of DaVinci Resolve. I'm running Studio 17 right now. And uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at it. I'm in my folder. Uh, the Encounter 95 was the working title for the project uh, while we were shooting. And I've got a footage bin right here. And as you can see, there's nothing in my media pool quite yet. And in my footage bin, I have drone, GoPro, phone, Ursa Mini. Now, if this was a larger production, something shot over the course of multiple days, inside of footage, I would list day one, day two, day three, day four, and so on. And then inside each day, I would have each of my camera sources, drone, GoPro, phone, Ursa Mini. And then inside each of those, I might even go so far as to have each card listed. So if I went into Ursa Mini, there would be card one, card two, card three, or whatever card we were on for the uh, number of that production. I would keep everything incrementing. And that's just to keep it all organized. So here you can see that this is card one, A001. And then we've got the dates and times, and then you've got the, the clip number and stuff like that. And honestly, I half the time don't set my date and time. I need to get better about that, but it is what it is. Let's go back up to the main footage. I'm just going to go and bring all of these right into my project. And it might complain for a second. I'm not going to worry about changing it right now. I know my project is set to 1920 by 1080 at 24 frames a second. And now that I've brought in all my footage, you can see I've got access to it all right here, which is pretty cool. The next thing we need to do is actually create a new timeline with all of this footage. So I'm going to jump over to my edit page. As you can see, I don't have a cut page on here. I disabled it because I don't use it. So I just go straight from media to edit. And I'm going to go ahead and select all my clips. I'm gonna right click and say, create new timeline using selected clips. And we are gonna call this uh, raw footage or dailies. In fact, maybe we'll just go dailies. 01, meaning day one. I only need one audio track, I only need one video track, that's all fine. And we're gonna use the project settings. I'm gonna turn off selected media uh, mark in and out. If I'd already set in points and out points on the media, that's what that's from. Hit create. And now you can see that we have a timeline with the raw footage. Now all this was shot, like I said, raw on my Ursa Mini 4K. You can see up here that it's, you know, some of these shots are Cinema D and G, because that's what the Ursa Mini shoots. If you're shooting B Raw, uh, Red, whatever, doesn't matter. It's all there. Now, I could edit this as it is. It's not horrible, but it's a very milky looking shot, and we want to work with the Aces workflow. So what I want to do now is I actually want to set up my Resolve project to be working with Aces, and here's how we're going to do that. Click down here on your settings, and drop down to Color Management. By default, we can see that our color science is DaVinci YRGB. We're going to change that to ACES CC. Okay, the difference between CC and CCT is CCT has a toe that gives you milkier blacks. For this particular project, I'm trying to emulate something from the, the 70s to 90s, so I'm going to just go with regular ACES CC. Make sure you choose the most recent version of ACES. That's going to give you the most amount of uh, camera options. And then finally, I want to make sure that I set my ACES output device transform to sRGB because that's what my computer monitor is. 
So that's all you need to know so far is just set it up like that, hit save. And now you can see there's a lot more color and a lot more contrast to these raw shots. And that's because it's now taking the camera footage and throwing it into the ACES color science. Now we're going to have a few issues when we get down to like the, the drone shots down here. So here's a drone shot and we can see that this just looks horrible now. So how do we fix that? Well, if I go and I find the shot in the media pool, uh, let's see, find in media pool, there it is. I can now take my drone shots, okay, from here to here, select them all, right click it, and we need to throw this into the ACES color space too. So I'm gonna go ACES input transform, and this is where you would look and see if your camera exists. So if this was shot on like a T2i, I would choose the Canon 7D. If you shot it on Alexa, you know, whatever, you can really go through and customize what color science you're using. Because my drone is not listed in here, uh, I have two options. I could go sRGB, okay, and that gets me back to that flat log look. I could also try uh, ACES input transform. I could try doing it as a Rec. 709. And I like that look a little bit better. It's a little bit more contrasty. So we're going to run with that for now. Next, we're going to hop over to the Deliver tab. And I have a custom preset already set up for Avid Media Composer. And let's take a look at what this is. We are going to set this up to render individual clips using the clip source name. We want to export the video as MXF OP Atom. Okay, you'll see there's a bunch of different options, but we want OP Atom. I'm going to use DNX HD, and then you can choose which flavor you want. In the past, I worked a lot at uh, DNX HD 36. A lot of the Transformer movies were originally cut with this when that came out. Currently, though, I've been really into the uh, 115 8 bit, and it just gives you a little bit better quality without taking up a whole lot more space. Go to audio, make sure that's looking good. File, source file name. That's all good like that. All right, cool. Now, where are we going to stick this? I'm going to go to browse and I'm going to go to the root directory of my drive. Let's see, I'm on my library drive. And inside here, you want a folder called Avid Media Files and then MXF. And then you've got all these numbered folders. And basically, the way Media Composer works is it's going to read from this database. This is a database that's being set up. So we're going to render into it. So what I would do each day of a film shoot, I would come in here, I would go new folder, give it the next number in sequence, jump into there, hit select folder, and that's where I'm going to send these renders to. Add to render queue, click render all, and you're good to go. Because I've already rendered this and preset it up, we can see I've done that right here. This is in folder number 13. And I rendered these around the, the beginning of the year. And then there's this MDB file, this master database, essentially. And we're going to use this here in just a second to import it to Avid. So let's go ahead and save our work here in Resolve. Exit out of there. And we're going to jump into Avid Media Composer. All right. So here we are. I'm just going to go ahead and create a brand new project. We're going to call this Asus Test. And 1920 by 1080 at 24p, right? You could go 24 or uh, 23976, but I did shoot this at flat 24, so that's what I'm using right there. And we're gonna hit okay. There it is, ACES test, I'm gonna go into it. And uh, here we go. So now I've got this ACES test bin, and all I need to do to import my footage is drag this MDB file right here into the bin, and there's all my footage. It is here and ready to go. If I change my, my setup, we can see my icons. And we can see it all works just beautifully and now I'm all set to edit. And you can go through and organize and do whatever you need to do from here. So I can load footage into my viewer, choose my, my shots that I want, drop them down into the timeline, right? I mean, this is just editing, it's very basic. Let me go ahead and open up the uh, final edit that I did in Avid and we'll, we'll show you how to continue and get, bring this now back into Resolve once your editing's done. All right, so now we are back into the project and we have my, my cut. This is what came out of Avid and I sent over to Resolve afterwards. And I want to show you with a full project that's dealing with a couple of mixed frame rates, right? We got a couple different things going on. Now, when I did this edit, I didn't use a color managed workflow originally. So that's why these are looking a little milky again and a little bit flat. However, had I edited with my color managed footage, this would all be looking a lot better right now. 
but point being, you bring your files into Avid, you do your editing, right? You've got the entire movie, the entire project down here. I'm not going to spoil how the, the short film ends. And now we need to send this back to DaVinci to conform and get ready to start going into visual effects and sound and, and all the other stuff. So what we're going to do is with the timeline selected, go file and come on down to export. And I have a project or a preset already set up. So I'm going to take my rough cut, use my, exp uh, use my preset. If I go into options, you can see what I'm doing. It's just a standard AAF file. And I'm going to use all the video, all the audio tracks, basically everything that's here I want to send over. The other important thing is I'm linking to the media, right? We don't want to actually export. We don't want to consolidate. We don't want to do any of that kind of rubbish there. We literally just want to link to this media. And uh, so I can save that as a new preset. Choose where I want to save the AAF file. In my case, let's see. It's just sitting right down here. I've got like Fins Test, uh, Rough Cut 2. This is actually probably the, the one I want to use for it. Um, and we hit save. I'm not going to overwrite what I've already done. Okay. But now we've got our, our edit here and we're going to bring it into Resolve. So let's go and close out of Avid. Okay. And I'm going to, I'll just fire up the Aces sample this time. It'll work. All right. So here's right, right where we left off. I'm going to go and create a new bin right now to make this a little bit easier. We're going to call this timelines. Okay. I want to move this one timeline over into it. The dailies one that we're in right now keep track of things. We're going to move that into there. Go into the timelines folder. All right. And now in my timelines bin, I'm going to go file, import, timeline, choose what I want to bring in. Just remember, find that AAF file. And I want to disable automatically import source clips and click link to source camera files. Okay. Those are the only changes I need to make. I can also rename my timeline. I can call it Avid if I want. doesn't matter. Hit OK. It's going to ask me where I want to send it to. I'm going to say there, hit close. And there we have it. Now I've got my entire timeline from Avid here inside of Resolve, which is pretty cool. Now I've got some color management issues going on. That's okay. They'll be easy to fix. And if I uh, like right click a clip and say, find a media pool, we can see it's sending me straight to my original raw cinema DNG file. So now I've got the entire edit here inside of Avid. That's pretty cool. The uh, few shots that are not coming up right, that were not color managed, were from my Samsung. So these sh monster shots down here. So I'm gonna take this one down to this one. And uh, let's go and put our cursor over that. We can go right click, Aces Input Transform. And make sure we set these up right here. I didn't set this camera earlier. Let's go Rex 709. There, now everything looks right. Cool. So now we have color managed our edit. We've brought it into here. We haven't had to use any LUTs or anything like that yet. We're just working straight up with the, the original raw files now. All right, and that is how you would round trip from Resolve to Avid Media Composer and then back into DaVinci Resolve to do your conform. We literally just conformed it in a matter of seconds. It doesn't need to be super difficult or anything like that. All right, so pretty cool. Now that we've got our timeline in here, let's take a look at how we would get a shot over to Nuke using the same ACES color managed workflow. So I've got this shot here and I want to replace the license plate because back in the 90s, this uh, don't tread on me license plate, you can see it's a Galdensian flag. This didn't exist back then. Now, even though this is a, a more modern car, this is a 2014 Ford Escape, um, I still want to make sure that my license plate matches. Or maybe you're one of those like really anal OCD people that don't want the license plate featured in the film and you want to do an effect to cover it. We could jump over to Fusion and do our shot right here. We've done that on the channel plenty of times. But in a more professional environment and workflow, you're probably going to be working with Nuke. And so I want to show you how to do that. So let's go ahead and jump over to our output settings or deliver page. And we need to do a few things first. I want to go ahead and set this up to be the right aspect ratio and the right file or the right size for the project. And that's going to be 2048 by 858 DCI scope 2.39. Okay. And yours may be different than this. That's okay. This is just what I'm choosing for my 2k master because I'd want to do a DCP to show this in a theater afterwards. I'm going to go down to image scaling. And we want to make sure that we're set to scale full frame with crop for input scaling. Output scaling also needs to be scale full frame with crop. I'm going to hit save. 
and we can see that that now automatically crops us down to a 2-4-0 aspect ratio. Pretty cool. And the entire movie is set up that way. The next thing I want to do is I want to turn off my uh, viewer output display transform that I'm doing with my ACES stuff. We don't want this, this LUT essentially being baked into the footage. We want to go back to that linear space. So I'm going to come down to my settings, go back to color management, and under ACES output device transform, we're going to say no output transform, hit save. It's going to jack up the colors right now, but when we go into nuke, it's going to look fine. Next, I'm going to use my nuke preset, and I'll show you how you can build this up yourself. We are going to set single clip, because you're probably only going to do one shot at a time. Export the video as an EXR format. Okay, you got a whole list of stuff. We want to use the EXR. Codec, out of all these, choose RGB half PIZ compression. You could work in float if you wanted to as well, but for right now, to keep my file sizes down, because it is just a short film, I'm going to go RGB half. My resolution is set to the project, 2048 by 858 DCI scope, and I'm shooting at 24 frames a second, so that all gets carried over as well. I'm not going to mess with the color space tags and things. I could probably do that instead of turning off my output display transform. I just like doing that because I can see that it doesn't look right now, which tells me that it's going to be right when I go back into nuke. So that's why I leave it like that. Go ahead and give the uh, the shot a name. Actually, let's go and choose where we want to save it first. And so I'm going to go uh, library, films, encounter 95. I might go into VFX. And we can see I've got my stuff here. I'm just going to create a test folder in here right now. Aces test, terst test. Go into there, hit select folder. And now I can give it the file name. Uh, fins underscore aces underscore. Go over your file. Make sure that you've got enough digits in the file name. I like starting each clip at one. Now, if you're working in a more professional setting where you need to keep track of time codes and stuff like that, go ahead and uncheck this. You don't want each clip to start at one. You want to start at the what the actual frame number for that clip is. For my workflow, working by myself, uh, doing that works just fine, though. I'm going to just start it at one. It's easier for me to work with it that way. I don't have to think about it as much. So we got all that set up now. It's a lot of information. If you need to go back and pause to do it, go for it. And now we're going to hit Add to Render Queue. And we would go ahead and hit Render. In fact, I'm actually going to go ahead and do it in this case to, to show you that we're working with the real shot. Oh. <laughs> one other thing that I just forgot... <laughs> is that we want to render, uh, let's see, right click the clip and go render this clip. We only want to render that in and out range on that particular clip. Now let's add to the render queue. We'll replace what was already done and hit render all. All right, render's done. We can see it was a nine second clip and it took us 14 seconds to render, so not horrible at all. Let's go ahead and jump into Nuke. All right, here we are inside of Nuke. I am using kind of a custom workspace. I've got some changes I've made to it. That's okay. Everyone's going to work differently inside of Nuke. What we need to do now is read in the footage. And let's see if I go up one. Aces test. There it is. Okay. I'm going to hit open. All right, so now we need to put this into the Aces color space. How are we going to do that? Let's go ahead and press S in our uh, properties. And that brings up the project settings. And I want to jump over to color. We want to change the color management from Nuke to OCIO. That's going to give us a bunch of different options over here. Okay. And I'm going to choose my OCIO configuration to ASUS 1.2. Okay. Now I'm going to go to my read node and choose input transform to default scene linear. And now check that out. We're working with a much better color space at this point. And we can see that our viewer has changed itself to sRGB aces. So now theoretically, I should be able to bounce between the two. If I re-enable my transform over here, Let's see, where is it? sRGB. Theoretically, okay, this should match that. And it matches it pretty close as you can see. That's, that's pretty, pretty accurate right, right off the bat. So that's the cool thing is now I'm, I'm working with my log footage still, but be, by using the ACES color space, I'm not having to do uh, conversions and stuff like that like I might have done in the past. 
So now let me open up a shot that I've already done with all the, the compositing and we'll, we'll take a look at it from there. All right, so here's the same shot. You can see we're still working in the Aces color space and you can see that I replaced the license plate on the car with something that actually existed back in the 90s. So here is the before and there's the after, just like that. Now in our right node, to save this back out to an image sequence that we can use, we want to make sure that we apply an output transform, and that's going to be done right here. So we wanted to go compositing linear, ACES to ACES CG, okay? So we're just going to use that compositing output transform. We're still going to do an EXR file, 16-bit half, PIZ wavelet, 32 scan lines, you know, all that's good. Same thing that the file came in as. And uh, choose where you want to save it and render it out. Back inside of Resolve here, I'm going to go to my media pool and I'm gonna go find the final shot. So I would go to, let's see, library, films, counter 95, VFX, and this is shot 103. And then I can see that I've got the plate and I've got the final. So the final has got that full effect applied. You can see there's the new license plate. And I would bring that into a new bin over here called VFX finals. So we bring in our effect shot. There it is. Jump back to our timeline. And uh, we just need to go ahead and replace it. So we're going to go ahead and add a track. There it is right there. It's going to give ourselves some more room to work with. And bring in that VFX shot over the top. And if we mute the track on and off, see we need to get that lined up a little bit more. Again, muting on and off. There we go. Little slight color shift taking place. Nothing too major. But the biggest thing is making sure that there's no jitters in the frame. What we don't want to see is it jumping from shot to shot. Just make sure you get that lined up properly. And away we go. So let's recap so far. We brought our footage into Resolve. We threw it into the Aces color space. Sent everything over to Avid to do the offline editing brought our offline back into Resolve, did a conform to it automatically, exported this over to Nuke. We did the visual effects in Nuke, still using a color managed workflow. We worked within the ACES color space and brought our shot out of Nuke back here into DaVinci Resolve. And now we're ready for a color grade. So let's go ahead and talk about color grading within the ACES workflow. If I jump over to my color page, here we are. And I wanna make sure I've got my visual effects shot. Okay, and I can see it's got the right one. It's got the right license plate. I don't want to be on this one. I want to be on this one. Now, how do we do this? Let's go ahead and get rid of the gallery for now. And uh, I'm going to get rid of the timeline as well. Shrink that down. Just give us some more space to work with like that. You're going to find when you start using ACES that color responds like super, super sensitive. If I start moving these things around, like it just goes super, super quickly. And it doesn't take much at all. You can see I've hardly moved the the wheel and everything already went blue. Uh, go and reset that. Same thing with the gamma. If I do the same thing, you know, I start pushing stuff around, very, very hardly move it and everything's already affecting the colors. So what I actually want to do is jump over to my log and use the controls here inside of log. Now, as I move stuff around, I'm playing with the shadows, right? tones okay you can see you get a lot more range out of it as you move it around this way now I don't know for sure if this is the right way to do it this is just the way I've been doing it and it seems to work out okay now on this particular film I was trying to emulate something from the 90s so I wasn't going with this like a crazy color grade like this I literally did all my color grading using my RGB mixer because that's really all that they would have had access to back then. So you're just controlling the amount of red, green, and blue inside of the image. And even then, it hardly took any of this at all to, uh, to work with it. And you can also go ahead and, uh, let's see, flip back over to here. You've got your temperature controls, right? You can warm it up, cool it down. You can tint stuff. Contrast. I mean, real, real basic, right? Just keeping your controls as basic as can be for it. All right, so let me jump over to my other timeline now 
that's all color graded and stuff like that. And I want to show you just a few more things as we get ready to uh, export this out. All right, so this is the finished timeline for my short film. I've got all my sound work done down there. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, looking at my video tracks that I'm working with here. Again, let's give us some more room to work with here so we can see this. Let's see what we've got. So I've got my main camera footage. Again, this was the edit from Avid. If I knew it was going to be a visual effects shot, I moved it up to another track called VFX Selects, and I made that one green so they all stand out to me. If it was a shot I moved into Nuke and then brought back, I went ahead and created another track called VFX Finals. And the idea being that at any given time, I can see what shots are the effect shots, and I can also go ahead and um, flip back to the original source if I ever needed to. So something like this. I could easily, if we watch the, the license plate down here, I could turn off my final and jump back to the, the original shot there. Now I've done some stabilization and cropping and stuff like that to it. So if we look at the final, we could say I did a little bit of repo, some reframing. And then the other thing you'll see up here that says fins grade. Once I color graded, once I did all my visual effects, everything was done. I rendered it out uh, as just a normal QuickTime file and brought that back into the timeline spit that over the top and that just means that now as i'm doing my sound mix i get real-time playback because if i turn this off and i try to get real-time playback out of all this here it's going to fit it's jumpy it's not working it's not doing what i need it to if i turn on my pre-rendered file okay we can see our playback it's a lot better all of a sudden so when i'm doing my sound work i like to work with this pre-rendered file so now we jump over to the Fairlight page and we do our sound mixing, right? And there's a thousand tutorials on how to do sound mixing here inside of Fairlight. You can see I've got all my sound effects. I like using Fairlight right now because I do have access to my sound library. So I can come in here and choose either the built-in one that comes with Resolve or I can use my own local database where I've got literally 10,000 different samples of different stuff. So I could come in and like, I could type in whale and I've been using these whale moans. And I use that a lot for the sound of the creature and that kind of a thing. Uh, we also use like rattlesnakes and alligator hisses and all sorts of stuff. All the stuff down here at the end is for the creature. But again, we don't want to spoil the short film because it's not out yet. So do your sound mix. Again, we're using the, the pre-rendered file up here. So we get the real time playback. Okay. Bounce back over to our timeline. Now we're ready to do our final export. So I want to turn off the pre-render. So now I'm looking at the original camera files. I look all the way through. I've got my titles on here. The reason why these are all so big like this, even though my titles only come at certain sections, is because I've got video effects on the titles for different things uh, to create that 90s vibe. And now we can go back to the deliver page. So, two schools of thought for exporting your masters. One, export your timeline straight into whatever format you want to go. If I want to go straight to YouTube, I'll click YouTube. If I want to do a DCP or something like that, I would go ahead and go to custom, build up, build up the DCP. The other school of thought is give yourself a digital master to work from, bring that into a whole new timeline, and then export all your dubs from there. The advantage to that is that if your computer crashes or you have to stop the render somehow in the middle of the, the, the movie, and if you're working on you know a 90 or 120 minute movie, you don't have to start rendering your master again from scratch. You can pick up where you left off because you're doing it as an image sequence. You would usually use something like a TIFF file. Uh, so let's go custom. So I'm gonna say format TIFF. I would render my master probably at RGB 16 LZW compression. Okay, make sure you set your frame rate right. Set your project size to be correct. Oh, that's not it. I want, where is it? That one right there. And now I would choose a new folder for my master, add to render queue, and that's gonna send that all into a image sequence, just like we were working on with our visual effects. Now, your audio, same thing. You can render it out as WAV files. I find that audio typically isn't going to crash your project. So what I would be more inclined to do would be render out my Im image sequence, bring that back into the same timeline up here on another track, like I did with my pre-render here, and then render out my dubs from there. 
and if you use this TIFF RGB 16-bit with LZW compression, it should look almost identical to your Ross uh, graded footage. All right, we have gone over a lot of stuff. This has been a very in-depth video tutorial, I know that. It's really more of a, a workflow overview, but I really wanted to show you guys how you at home on just a single computer can emulate a Hollywood workflow from start to finish and, and really get the best image quality you can out of what you're working with. Now, the, the, the compression codecs I'm showing you guys over here, a lot of that is really up to you, especially when you're doing the visual effects stuff. You know, pick what's going to work best and what's going to work best for your hard drive. But OpenEXR is really the only format that works with that color managed workflow when you're sending stuff to Nuke and back. So I really do recommend that when you're sending stuff over to Nuke that you use the EXR. You could go with full floats and, and even still throw some compression on it. That's totally fine. Maybe you find that that works better for you. Uh, but really EXR is going to be where it's at. Remember coming in here, turning off your color management uh, for the output device transform, turning that on and off depending on what part of the process that you're in. If you have any questions, let me know down below. If you have other ideas, different ways that you've been using a color managed workflow, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. I'm still learning this myself. That's why I'm practicing with the short film before I get into my full feature. Because once you start on a feature, it's really hard to change things mid-course without undoing all the work that you've done. So I'm really trying to dial this in now on a short film. And I wanted to show you this workflow on a real short film. Too many other tutorials out there, they do it with a, you know, three clips in a timeline and they're moving stuff around like, oh, see, it works. I wanted to show you guys with a real short how to actually do it and show you that it actually does work in that type of scenario. So I hope you guys have enjoyed. My name is Chris Temple uh, with Pyro Studios, and you've been watching Indie Rebel, Hollywood effects without the Hollywood budget.